Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. I'm really excited to share today's guest's story with you all. And before we jump in, I'd really appreciate if you could take a moment and rate the podcast on Spotify or on Apple. And this is going to allow the podcast to reach more people. So without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. All right, folks, I'm super excited to share my guest today. So it's Jarlo from GMB Fitness. And I came across Jarlo back in 2016 when I went through the apprenticeship. And I've learned a ton from him to date on all things rehab. So I'm really excited to pick his brain. So Jarlo, thanks for taking time out of your day. And why don't we start with a bit about yourself? Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, well, I'm a physical therapist since uh, 1998. Uh, done a lot of things in therapy, but mostly outpatient orthopedic. So, you know, back pain, neck pain, ankles, all sports injuries and that kind of stuff. But I've also done uh, stroke rehab and, you know, major medical things, which was interesting because even though that wasn't my specialty, it did help me a lot bringing it back into, you know, uh, what people would say, you know, kind of normal run of the mill problems people have, you know, sprained ankle. Uh, some of it was perspective. I mean, if you look at it, if it, your knee hurts a little bit, it's a lot, you know, relatively speaking, of course it's bad. It affects your life and all that, but, you know, compare that to having a stroke or <laughs> compare that to, you know, recovering from a bad car accident and that type of thing. But, you know, with that kind of relativity, you can give a, a perspective for yourself and for your clients and your patients. So um, I did a lot of post-graduate uh, work in manual therapy, you know, hands-on uh, joint manipulation, mobilization, that type of thing, which was really good. I mean, I really enjoyed it. And it helped a lot, again, in terms of relating to the patient, kind of being able to provide them different things. But, you know, as you go on, as the years go on, you realize the most important thing is giving a person uh, autonomy, giving them person information, you know, helping guide them to uh, take care of themselves. So I got less and less uh, enamored of the, you know, passive approach. Right, the passive approach of lie down on the table. I'll give you, you know, I'll work on your limbs and I'll see you later. Right, a lot more education, a lot more giving people an understanding of why they might be having that pain or what's going on beyond, oh, yeah, you have arthritis or this is this particular ligament is the thing. That's not as helpful as some people might think, right? I mean, you the whole term of medicalizing pain and suffering. We try to, as healthcare providers, we try to do that and help people understand where they're at, but doing, doing it in that way, in that really specific sort of medical, non-personal way often does more harm than good, right? And I kind of understood that more as the years went on as working with patients, but also in the you know pain science in the last 15, 20 years, has uh, been remarkable, like they're showing us exactly what's going, not exact, but showing us what's going on and showing us, you know, what people might uh, be experiencing beyond, you know, damage is pain. And if you have pain, it's damage. So a couple of years ago, or actually three years ago now, I went through a pain science certification, therapeutic pain science work, which is really good. That was with uh, evidence and motion with the and yeah, I mean, it's funny, all these things I, I like, I don't see as much patience in person anymore, you know, just every once in a while, but through our company with GMB Fitness and, you know, answering emails and questions and going on seminars, you know, this type of educational work and helping people understand, I've been able to help more people than if I had stayed in the clinic, you know, even 40, 50 hours a week, you know. Yeah, mate. <clears throat> There's so many things there you've touched on that I'd like to dive into. Um, yeah. So you were saying like you went to like physio physical therapy, and that was your studies. You did a went into a masters as well in physical therapy. Yeah. So that's a 
in the U.S., this was okay. So this was mid '90s, and back then, it was either a bachelor's or a, a master's in, in physical therapy. And soon after that, it became a, a doctorate level. But yeah, I did that. I was I had you do your undergrad. I thought I was going to be pre med, and I was like, oh, I'm going to be a doctor or whatever. But I did a uh, you know job shadowing and volunteer work and. You know, I was in the clinic. I was like, "Oh, this is this is what I want to do." I mean, it's sort of mm. that more of that one, one-on-one -on -one time, right? You, I don't know how it is over in Australia, but with doctors here, you hardly get you know fifteen, twenty minutes with a doctor, and that's once every whatever, right? A couple times a year, three times a year. Mm -hmm. You know, with a physical therapist, and this was back then. You know, you're seeing them two, three times a week. You know, forty-five minutes to an hour. It's interesting, though. I mean, talking about physical therapy versus personal training, personal trainers now, athletic trainers now, they're the ones kind of on the front lines more than anybody else. And that's why it was really interesting to be, you know, be able to help uh, train trainers and give them information and kind of steer them the, the way I think, uh, you know, they can best provide for their clients. I, I say that all the time. The relationship people have with their trainers now is is much more than than healthcare providers. I think. Yeah, for sure, mate. And like, so then you were doing the hands on therapy, and then you started seeing, okay, I can actually like educating people. And was that more like around environment er, environmental factors, how they're like they're spending their days essentially as well, and not just coming in to get like manual therapy done to them and then forgetting yeah. about everything yeah i think a lot of it came to um again in a kind of medicalized model you someone comes in you fix them and then you send them on their way but you know in terms of pain in terms of how this person is relating to their condition and you know the rest of their life right the 23 hours of the the day that there's not in your clinic that's what I came to realize. And it, it's sort of, and that's not a, you know, a revelation that, you know, no one has thought of before, but it's something that, you know, comes about when you're seeing, you know, over the years, you know, thousands of patients and some people respond really well, right. All you have to do is a little thing, show them, you know, show them a little bit and they're, and they're fine. But, you know, there's a, a significant amount of people where that's not enough. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to to show them, you know, how they can deal with this themselves. And it's again more than just here's a, a sheet of exercises. A lot of it is getting them to relate to what what is exactly happening in their body. Yeah. And I'd I'd love to talk to you about like that kind of shift in your career, like going to more educational based. And then when you started seeing, you know, literally thousands and thousands of emails or whatever through GMB Fitness, did anything, did you change your mind on anything during that process from, okay, first of all, doing manual therapy, then educating the client when you were in person, and then getting this massive, co you know, thousands of people online, did your thought process change in how you explain stuff or delivered information? Yeah, that's, that's a great observation. And right there, you said it, I mean, the volume of work. Right. So I've, you know, I've done a lot of different uh, small clinics, big clinics, hospitals, and even at my busiest, where I was working at a clinic and had, you know, therapy assistants that helped me manage the load, I was never seeing more than, you know, th that was too much. And that was like 20 to 30 people a day, right? 20 to 30 people a day, four days a week, right? Compare that to hundreds of emails a week. You know, especially in the beginning of GMB when, uh, you know, we were answering emails more ourselves, right? Everyone's coming in. And we didn't have uh, the staff that we have. And we were just, everything was new, right? And you start to see patterns. You start to see patterns in what people are asking. And over the years, you just, you can group them in into things, right? People asking the same things or worried about the same thing. And I don't say it changed what I was thinking, but it did help me to change how I communicate because it's much different than here 
talking one on one or one on one in person versus answering an email where the tone is not as right as easy to figure out right maybe there's cultural differences on top of that you know it changed more of me trying to make sure that I was communicating things well. Uh, does that make sense? It's it's sort of like I remember one time I had moved over I had moved over to Hawaii, right from Seattle to uh, to work and and do all these things. And by that time, you know, I was a few years out of school and I had developed a routine. You know, you take the patient's history. You know, you ask questions, and you just sort of get into this. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. But there was a big cultural shift where I would ask a certain question and expect a certain kind of response. And it was fully different, fully different. And it wasn't that they couldn't speak English. It was the same. It was English or whatever. But it was just a fully different uh, response to the same question that I'd asked over here in, you know, in Seattle or wherever. And it's the same thing. You know, you multiply that with emails coming in from you know australia new zealand uh europe asia right you're asking or you're answering the same kind of questions but the the reaction or the interpretation is fully different so mm. i would say that, that more than anything i had to uh kind of pare down what i was saying change some words like it, it's crazy right just a shift in one or two words that are essentially synonyms can change the entire interaction you have with somebody. Totally. Like it might it might be different, but it's something I noticed the more I traveled was like how much slang I used. And Irish people mm. use a lot of slang and a lot of a lot of normal terms in Ireland. People are like, I've no idea what you're talking about. Right, so exactly. it might be kind of exactly. similar when you're talking to people I, all I think over it the is. world. <clears throat> I think it is. I mean, you get into your groove and, and it re works really well and where you live, right? And uh, you develop it over time and then you're transplanted somewhere else. And it's like, again, it's like you're, you're speaking, you should be able to understand each other, but you don't. And would <laughs> you say that process, uh, did that improve your overall communication skills, you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, again, I, you, you first you get out of school, whether you're a trainer or a therapist or a doctor or an accountant or whatever, you learn how to speak with people in that context, right? It's totally different than you know talking with your friends and all of that. But once you get someone in a room, and I have thought about this all, a lot, right? You get someone in a room, they're already scared, they're already hurting, right? You add pain to the mix, you add that anxiety, you add that fear, right? And that's what I saw mostly, uh, where people were coming in, and if they're already in that state, then you have a big responsibility to not make things worse, right? And I think we've all experienced that for for good or for bad, going in to see a you know a healthcare professional, and they may be good or whatever, but halfway through or afterwards you leave, you leave feeling worse and not even worse like in terms of oh i'm have more pain because they mess with my shoulder and you know, that's fine but actually you know having anxiety about it going oh is you know you know what i mean i mean it, it's it's a, a big reason why and we had talked about we talked about this in the company a lot why are people emailing us right this kind of this other this company emailing us about their back pain, their neck pain, their shoulder pain, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Don't they, don't they have doctors? Don't they have you know physicians they can go to? And a lot of it is they don't want to. Mm. Either they had a bad experience before, or they went and didn't really help, or they just don't want to go in. Right, and it's a massive responsibility to be able to give someone good information based on you know uh what you can give them that's in a way that's not unethical right not immoral that's that's mm -hmm. a huge thing for me there's a lot of bad information out there and bad information not even that it's untrue but information that when communicated in a certain way 
can uh, worsen a patient, worsen a person, right? What might be, uh, again, so say they sprain their ankle, right? And it's a couple months later and they're still feeling a little bit of pain. And, you know, they're wondering, okay, what is this? And if you say things in, in a way that uh, limit them, like, oh, that sounds like it's arthritis or that ankle, oh, man, it shouldn't be that bad at this amount of time. You know, you need to do this and this and this. That's not helpful. It's not, right? You want mm. to, that's one of the really good things over the last 10 years in terms of pain science and, and different types of uh, rehab thinking is that is movement optimism right getting people to understand that uh pain again isn't necessarily related to damage that there's ways that you can adjust your activities and what you can do to mitigate pain for sure but also to focus on your function focus on what you can do versus oh your back is the worst thing i've ever seen on my on your mri or you know, your disc is out and you need to be careful and limit your activities sure some of that is true with limiting your activities, but don't keep people at a, you know, at a ceiling and say that they're never going to improve. Yeah. I that's mean, such a powerful. Yeah. It's huge. So I think that was a big part of, again, why are people asking some random person on the internet what to do? Right. And unfortunately, you know, the advice coming from that other person might not be the best thing. So how do we help people sort through that? I think, I think that's a huge thing for me. Yeah. One thing I'd like to hear your thoughts on as well, uh, it's actually come up a lot for me over the last few months with people. And they tell me that they've seen someone, and you know, I'm not wanna, I don't want to be bashing doctors or other physios or whatever, sure. but they said the, pr the practitioner said it was just wear and tear and that's just the way it is. Like that sounds very like there's no ownership now. And that's just, you, you kind of, it's a bit disabling. Uh, oh yeah, then, absolutely. Do you want to maybe. Yeah, that's a, talk that's a, you know, it kind of really hues into what I was saying. Um, you know, the term placebo, you know, the placebo effect where, you know, some innocuous or something that really shouldn't be helpful people get to it and it's helpful like homeopathy is a classic mm -hmm. one homeopathy where the substance that's in your you know potion or your liquid is it's better the less there is right i mean it's just it's just ridiculous okay mm -hmm. um but it's fine i mean as long as it's not like a thousand dollar or a little tincture you know whatever helps placebo is interesting because even and there's studies with that even in instances where the study participant is informed that it's a placebo they get better right they're not informed or they are informed. no they are they are informed yeah oh, it's yeah. nuts yeah yeah it's crazy they are informed that this is an innocuous substance right it, it's it's really interesting if you can look it up because you're like what well, doesn't even make sense but it does it, it helps them so there's that interaction. There's the interaction there between a person, you know, a client, a patient, and whoever's providing a service. And it can be good or bad. So placebo, placebo is that positive effect. Nocebo, have you heard of that? The nocebo is the negative effect. And that's the one where, like you said, oh, this is wear and tear. This is how it's going to be. It's not going to get better. You know, you should just deal with it, right? Or don't bend over because you're going to make your back worse because it's going to spurt out this disc. You should never bend over, right? Or all those types of things. Or if you don't get eight, here's another one. If you don't get eight hours of sleep, you're going to get injured. You're going to die, right? That main thing. Because, and that's an interesting to me, thing to me. It's like sleep is a good thing. Absolutely. You can't argue with it. But are you going to go to the extreme and say, well, if you don't get eight hours, you're going to live 20 years less, right? You're going to be eight more times likely to be injured. 
if you don't sleep well, then don't do anything else, right? If mm -hmm. you don't get eight hours of sleep, don't bother exercising, right? Don't bother doing any of this other stuff because you won't get better. That's a nocebo. It's absolutely as powerful of a, a thing as, you know, taking a hammer and hitting somebody in the knee. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. It's the psychological, physiological doesn't matter. What you're trying, what you're doing is absolutely affecting someone's uh, life by, you know, giving them very bad information. Now, whether that's malicious or just offhand, you know, most of the time it's just offhand. You don't think you're doing, you know, the person saying these things probably doesn't think they're, you know, maybe they think they're helpful. But really dig down deep into it. And whatever you're saying to someone, how is it going to affect them? And again, there's cultural differences. There's individual differences. There's where this person is in time. So you have to be careful. I, I really, really get uh, mad at, at uh, doctors and, or not even doctors, but everyone, anyone who gives information is it's flippant about it, mm -hmm. right? That someone's coming to you, whether in person or online for help, right? And if you don't, if you're not very careful, you're going to steer them the wrong way. Yeah. What I'd like you to touch on, you, you said patterns, but I'd actually love to know what those patterns were when you started seeing, okay, like hundreds, thousands of emails over the course of 10 years, what things kept coming up and what patterns did you see? Sure. Uh, a lot of it is with people, and, and this goes back to what we're saying, people are always asking questions, worried that they're going to do the wrong things, right? Looking for help with, uh, you know, well, let's go to fitness or pain or, you know, conditioning. They want to make sure there's two things. They either want to make sure what they're doing when they're spending time on is going to be useful and helpful for them. Right. Cause you don't, we don't, everyone's busy. They don't have so much amount of time. We don't want to do a thing, right. Whether it's go on a diet, go on an exercise program or go do a few exercises they want to make sure it helps them, right? There's one. Then the other thing is they're worried that whatever they do or whatever they've chosen, is it going to hurt them, right? It's either if it's going to help me or if it's going to hurt. You know, those are just the two things. Information there is, is massive because we can go the other way and go, yeah, don't do this. Don't twist. Don't bend over. Don't do this. Don't, 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 don't. Right. You can go in that direction or you can go, well, this is this we've seen to be helpful. You should try. You can try this. You can do this. So right there you have a dichotomy of the don't do this kind of in the negative attitude response or let's try this. Let's do this. This has been helpful. A little bit of this. And right there you can shift over. And if you can help shift over some of that mindset for that person that you're responding to, I think that's helpful too. And it can be subtle, right? Uh, growth mindset is another one of the concepts and principles uh, we try to hew to. And growth mindset more than anything, you know, takes time if, if you're kind of not in that mindset, if you're fixed or if people around you have steered you towards being fixed, it can take time to, to get out of it. So I would say those type of patterns, you know, people are always looking for information, mm. right? I am too. Like uh, I'm dealing with some, you know, uh, cervical nerve problems, you know, I'm going to doctors, physiatrists, you know, asking different people. And I have a, I have knowledge of this, right? But when you are experiencing pain or you're experiencing problems, uh, you're always going to seek out. Mm -hmm. And so what can we do as, uh, you know, education, educators and, and trainers and, and all of that? I think a big part of it is getting them out of that uh, don't attitude. Don't do this. Don't do that. And again, it could be helpful. You're trying to help someone. It's like, oh, if it hurts when I, when I uh, lift my arm up, I, oh, don't lift your arm up then. Mm -hmm. 
it's true, but it's also not as helpful as it could be, right? right? Yeah. So those types of patterns, and also you look at, you know, we we try to help people, and, and in certain groups, there's people that, and you've seen it before in fitness, they have done nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Straight up nothing, and now they want to do something. That's very different than helping, say, uh, someone that was very active in secondary school or university right and then they've spent a few years on their job and they not they haven't done anything but now they're ready to go back into it right so you have to look at a person's history where they're coming from and again you can commute you have to communicate with those people in different ways right mm -hmm. a lot of uh a lot of what i always said to our trainers and you know some of our clients is it Every time we do a training session, it's a chance to get to know ourselves better. Right. I like that. Right. A lot of this is self knowledge. If you know you're a certain way, it helps you to steer to uh, to guide your your training. Right. A lot of answers can be answered well if you have some of that, if you have that self knowledge. You know that introspection is huge. Can you give uh, an example of that? Yeah. Um, so this is something, oh yeah, it was a few months ago coming up with something. A lot of this uh, we see, especially in social media and and all of that out there in fitness seems very extreme. Either it's you need to plan your day to the minute and make sure you get 45 minutes of zone two cardio, make sure you work on your mobility for an hour, right? Strength train, you know, an hour on top of that, or everything you do is useless. If you don't do that, you know, might as well not do anything at all. At the other extreme is, oh, you only have to walk a little bit, you know, briskly walk, you know, go in the garden. And yes, for some people, it's like that. If they're doing nothing at all, right, then a little bit is better. Right. So there's that massive extreme or it's the it's no, not or. But in addition to that, there is the never miss a day. Right. You should do everything every day. If you feel bad, you know, suck it up. Right. You're, you're only tired. You know, you're only 40 percent done when you're when you feel like you can't be, you know, do anything. That kind of stuff. Versus that's uh, oh, that's a GMB motto right there, I think. Right. Just right. Said. <laughs> right. Or it's, oh, if you don't feel that great, you know, you should skip the day only, only train when you feel like, you know, you're ready. Right. So those are the extremes. So in terms of self-knowledge, we all know if we're very honest with ourselves, what our tendencies are. So I'll tell you right now, I would much rather be sitting down reading, right? for most of the day and i do actually my default is that and so if i know that about myself and i'm going well i don't really want to work out today or i don't really want to train but there's nothing else you know i'm not like it's not like oh I, i'm so tired i can't do anything it's more like oh i and i don't really feel like it you know that straight up i should probably go and at least do 20 minutes of something, right? 30 <laughs> minutes of something. The other way is if you know that you have that personality, that type A personality of pushing hard, always pushing hard. I'm going to push hard. I'm going to do it. And you have that feeling of, man, I don't really want to do anything today. I'm supposed to train this amount. And you know you're you push hard you know you would do it but you already have this sense that you shouldn't you don't that's unusual so that doesn't fit your tendency so that's something that maybe you got to listen to right does that make sense yeah. so now we have a nuance that we can handle for uh, we can use for ourselves if you know that you are you know lazy or whatever but you know that you know you would rather be doing this or doing something else, 
but everything else is kind of fine. And yeah, you should motivate yourself to, to go and do work, right? But if you have a pattern of always overdoing it, right, always doing this or always doing that, or people even say that about you, yeah, you're always on the go. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I don't feel good. Does it do you any good to go and push yourself even more? Probably not. That's kind of a good example of self-knowledge. You're kind of using your tendencies, acknowledging your tendencies, acknowledging your history, right? So you can have that. Some people need that Instagram post of, you know, embrace the suck and get up off your ass. And, you know, some people need that. Yeah. But also some people need the other one that's saying, oh, we try and relax right don't worry so much don't be obsessed so you should sort yourself out a little bit into that and, and we go in waves sometimes we're here sometimes we're there that i think is a good example that everyone can spend a few minutes just kind of thinking okay where i where am i at usually and then yeah. where am i at today i think that's you know, auto regulation in general is self-regulation is, i think is that more than anything very specific. You can do you can be very specific in exercise with auto and self-regulation, being very specific within session or within your training, but you can also have it just in general with your with your life. That was such a good breakdown, man, because as you said, <clears throat> I actually got a question from a friend yesterday. He was like, I'm not sure uh, I'm doing I'm starting doing cardio training again, but I saw on I think Huberman, like Huberman's awesome, but it's very much like yes. you need to do 20 minutes and you need to do it for this percentage. Right. Exactly. That's, the, that's the research. <clears throat> but me and my friend always have this conversation about like, I don't know if I'm being lazy or if I'm, if I need a rest or I don't know if I should be pushing more or, you know, so the way you broke that down was so helpful. That's actually, I think what everyone that, that five minute clip is going to help people so much to just navigate and, and get to know themselves better. I think is, is really yeah. what you're getting at. Right. Yeah. It's hard though. It's hard mm. because uh, you're, you have to be very honest with yourself. You have to spend time. You know, that's another one of the things that we have in the GMB method is the ponder you know, mm -hmm. your introspection uh, at the end of your session or at the end of your day or whatever, right? It's a little bit of self-introspection, uh, a little bit of meditation on who you are, right? It's, it's kind of woo-woo, but it, it totally helps because you can answer a lot of your own questions. Again, if you're being... The honesty, though, right? That self-evaluation, that's the hardest part because you can lie to yourself very easily, Right. But uh, yeah, the human thing, or there's other people thing, or if you don't do 40 minutes of this at this certain percentage, then it's useless. Yeah. Well, how is that helpful? That is unhelpful. That's really bad. You're telling mm. some, you're telling someone it's either this or nothing. Yeah. That's essentially yeah, what you're yeah. saying. And even if it was true, right? Say it's true. Then how are you going to get a person? to actually do anything right mm -hmm. so say it is true that 40 minutes has to be the minimum and someone's like oh, i can't i can only do 10 15 20 minutes right how are they going to get the 40 minutes if they can't do the 10 15 20 minutes so you know th th does that make sense even totally. if it was true it's unhelpful even if it's the 100 percent truth it's unhelpful yeah. Right. And that's my thing. If whatever you're saying to this person, how helpful is it? It's not even if it's accurate. Mm -hmm. Is it beneficial? Right. All right. Because it could be, it could be 100% true. But do you need, does it need to be said? Does it help this person in their life? If it doesn't, you have to wonder why you're, why are you saying it then? Yeah. Right. Yeah, big time. And it kind of flies in the all the kind of habit and behavioral change stuff is all about small commitments, which is um it kind of flies in the face of that. Yeah, you know, like forty five oh, yeah. minutes and well, I yeah. can't even do ten minutes, so how am I meant to do forty five minutes, right? Yeah, small commitments and it again, it's the commitment part versus the small part. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. But it's usually easier to start small. Yeah. Some people it 
it is actually easier for them to schedule out, you know, the hour. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've seen that too, with a certain, whether it's your mindset, like in your mind, and here's the other thing, even if it were true that 15 minutes is better for you at this point, four times a week. But if in your head, you think 15 minutes isn't enough, like in your head, just like, oh, it's not, it won't help. Then it won't. Yeah. So it'd be better off if you found that hour for, for yourself or made that hour for yourself. So again, there's the nuance there. There's mm -hmm. a lot of information that it could be very helpful for one person and not for another. Yeah. I'd love to dive into the pain science side of things. Um, yeah. What did, what did you learn? Maybe what things did you, did you shift your mind on approaches or anything after going, it was three years ago you went through the course, was it? Yeah, so it was a uh, therapeutic pain specialist course. So it uh, essentially took a lot of the, you know, the research over the last 15, 20 years in, from, and it emphasized the educational standpoint, right? It's how you can deliver information to your patient, to your client. And it's a, little, a lot of, uh, probably not a lot of new things for people listening, but again, pain doesn't, Damage does not necessarily equal pain, right? Pain is an output, meaning the classic example, and this was uh, Mosley out of Australia and, or New Zealand, where his story was he was in the bush and walking along, and he got bit by a snake, right? He got bit didn't kind of realize it until later. And I might be, parap I'm paraphrasing all that. He didn't realize it until later and he realized it was his pain. And then he got, you know, it was painful. Then I think it was a month later or a little bit later, walking the same kind of area, same brush. And he, he had this tremendous pain again. I thought, oh, I must got bit again. But it wasn't. He had just, his ankle had just kind of brushed against the, a steak or, or you know, something like that. But it was the environment. It was the memory. And he had the same amount of pain, like worse. Then he looked down and he saw, oh, it's just a little scratch from like a branch, right? So you can take from that story and think all, all pain is in the head, right? It's just in your head. There's pain, whether you're, you know, and that's the wrong, that's the wrong way to think about it. Because yes, pain is in the nervous system, it's in the brain or, or, and all of that, but it doesn't mean it's any less real, right? So the pain he experienced from you know brushing against the stick versus the pain from the snake bite was the same, absolutely the same. You do an MRI, same lighting up in the brain area, same thing. Pain is a reaction to a threat to our system. Right. So you fall down, you hit your wrist. Yeah, it's painful. It's telling you, oh, maybe get that checked out. Don't use it. Right. You wake up with a crick in your neck or your back is stiff. You probably didn't fall. Right. You probably didn't have something hit you in the middle of the night, but the pain is the same. The pain is the same because the information from outside, you know, the external environment is being interpreted as a threat, right? So again, it doesn't matter if it's because you fell or, you know, sleeping wrong. There is probably some other things happening with that with uh, maybe you were, uh, you know, more tired today uh, from yesterday's activities. Maybe you're stressed from work. Maybe there's stuff other stuff going on in your, your home life, those things add up, right? Stress is a huge thing. And it's easy to, you know, there's, there's, again, there's a lot of nuance to it because you can't, you can blame everything on stress. Oh, it's stress. If you just kind of chilled out or did whatever, then it would be better. Sure. But does that help you kind of understand where you're at now? Right. I'd rather think of things as being additive, right? If you have only so much, you know, water in your bucket to put out a fire, right? But 
you got to throw a little bit on the stress. You got to throw a little bit on your, your poor diet, by dietary decisions, right? You got to pour a little bit of water on only got four hours of sleep. You got to, you know, all of these things, you only have so many resources. I think pain is a big part of that. Uh, And this is particular in regards to chronic and recurring pain, right? Chronic and recurring pain. Again, I mean, I'm not saying if you have a disc injury or if you have arthritis or if this, then all you have to do is think your way out of pain. You know, that's, that's not true at all. What I am saying is there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of, uh, again, inputs into why the pain that you're having is either ongoing or is higher, right? A lot of people, again, this is the extreme. They think, oh, you shouldn't have any pain at all. Pain-free existence. And that's a, that can be a really bad attitude to have too, right? Because we all have pain. I have pain sitting here right now. Right. But is it affecting my life? Is it affecting our conversation? And it's not. So imagine, say, you're at this level of having this, you know, back pain and you're cruising along. And suddenly it's like this, right? Suddenly it's higher because of whatever. I mean, I can't even say what it is. It's whatever it is. And you're staying there, right? And pain free is here. And you're, but you're up here and you're like, oh, I can't, I'm never going to get rid of it. And if someone's saying you have to go all the way down to here to live your life and be happy, but you can't do it for whatever reason, you can't do it. But if you can get to here, right? And here is below the threshold of affecting your life, then that is better than pain free. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And it's hard right. to, it's hard to get to, to that uh, that thinking. Like, okay, this is hard because you can think of all these hypothetical examples and all of this type of thing. But right now, I have, uh, some right pain, the middle, uh, medial knee, and I think it's probably because I was running and you know this past summer, and I don't know, I, I run on the road, right? Who knows what I did. <laughs> who knows what I did and I just kept running because it's whatever and then it got better for a few months and then last month I was squatting and I had to shift my foot a little bit and then it came back right but I know I didn't injure it I know it because I kept going but it came back and then now I feel it when I'm in a deep squat okay now I feel it in a deep squat I don't feel it anytime else except if I overdo things. Okay, so that's a that's my example right there. I even if I did injure it this past summer, that was six, seven months ago. Mm-hmm. Right? The tissue damage, it cannot be that I tore something. Can't. Right? I know this in my head. It cannot be that I, you know, damaged the joint. Can't. Because there was a period of two, three months. Or had no pain. Right. Then I had this incident where, you know, I was in squat. I had to shift a little bit because I, you know, the weight kind of walked. Mm-hmm. Right. But I didn't fall down, and, like twist my knee or whatever. I was just like, oh. Then I woke up the next morning and the same pain that I had months ago was there. Same thing. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, it'll go away. But it hasn't gone away in the last two, three weeks. Because I haven't changed anything to tell my nervous system that it's okay. Yeah, Does that's, that make sense? that's what I will. Yeah, totally. That's that's exactly actually what because, I wanted to ask you. Right. And I didn't change anything because I didn't. So here's the thing. I didn't change anything because I'm doing the same work. I actually did too much the other day because I was playing with the new exercise and it made it a little worse. Right. So I didn't change anything that way. But there was also two weeks I caught COVID uh, middle of last month, laid out. Mm. Um, okay, now, whatever. But there was two weeks where I couldn't do anything. Right, it's too, too uh, fatigued. Like, oh, man, I'm not going to do it. So I did nothing. 
still have pain in my knee because I didn't change anything. So I didn't change anything in terms of what I was doing before because, you know, I was just do my exercises, do whatever. Same thing of doing nothing, right? You would think, well, if I was sore, if I had a little bit of thing, I need to heal. So that two weeks, yeah, you could say, oh, my body's resources are going to COVID, whatever, whatever. It's the same thing. Either you don't change anything with, in your physical activity or you don't change anything with your zero physical activity. It's the information going to your nervous system. I think that's a good example, right? It's doing, uh, not changing anything is equal to not changing anything with, in your physical nature where you're doing the same kind of uh, uh, exercises, you know, range of motion, whatever, or you fully don't do anything at all. Because you haven't given any that does, you haven't given any new information to your nervous system to say everything is fine, because doing nothing and doing the same thing is the same information. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, totally. So, right. To change information to my knee, what I would have to do is work on, you know, different stimulus of being in that deep squat where I can either maintain that same level of pain or decrease it, but change the inputs, right? I'm, I'm doing it in a, I'm doing a force production in a little bit different way. I'm using uh, my ankles in a different way, you know, that type of thing where you're just kind of giving your nervous system uh, different types of stimuli, different types of sensory and reduce that threat, you know, protective response. Pain is good. Pain is supposed to protect you, right? Yeah. The when it's not good is when it uh, affects everything else and it doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's kind of a convoluted thing, but the main thing there is you have to figure out a way to uh, change the information that's going into your to your nervous system. And I, I use that example because I know I didn't care anything. Yes, mm -hmm. I could say it's my MCL it was you know, a little tender and you know, maybe it was strained six, seven months ago. But are you going to tell me that it's still there? That little bit of a tweak, right? Mm -hmm. That little bit of a ligament sprain is still there after seven months? It can't be. I can't. Yeah. Well, like uh, I had a back injury for about four and a half years. I still have it, but it's, or like it comes around time to time, but um, it's pretty much, I can pretty much do everything now. Um, Maybe awesome. if I'm sitting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been great. Um, But I guess what I'd love to know, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because what used to happen, I hurt my back. I think it was like L4, L5, uh, or L5S1, like that kind of mm -hmm. lower back area. I was doing back bending with a client and didn't really feel anything. But then the physio said, yeah, you've probably done some disc damage. Um, and then it would just get very, that kind of lower back top of the glute would just get really uh, achy. Um, and basically a lot of it, what I found uh like let's just say it would go away then i would do something and i would feel it but then i would right. panic and i'd be yes, like oh exactly. it's back i can't do my job exactly I'm 31 exactly. i'm gonna be you know i'm gonna like you know and i would just it would have anxiety essentially so like exactly exactly what I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on is like okay so that's happening and then it started the 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 impact started to lessen over the last kind of two years. So then I wasn't worried as much. And then I'm like, I'm like, oh, exactly. it's getting better. It's getting better. It's fixed. Yeah. So, so that's the spiral right there, right? I mean, it's either you can spiral downward or, you know, the habits and, and the changes can, like you said, lessen. So we're there with what your experience was kind of relates to mine. There was a there's a period of time where it felt okay, right? It felt fine. You can do things. That I think is something you and me and our clients tell them that and let give give them that chance to go. See, there was something there. 
and it improved for a while, but then it flared up when you did this, right? Flaring up is a great one rather than saying it damaged or you did this, mm -hmm. right? Something triggered it, something flared it up. And again, that's the protective response from our nervous system. And it's a good thing. It's good. Our brain, our nervous system is saying, okay, you know, maybe relax, chill out. What we have to do is convince it, convince ourselves that we can mm -hmm. gradually improve our capacity through there. Right. And I think that's what I have to do is yes, but the anxiety is, oh man, it's real. Yeah. And it and it's normal. You should be. Because if you're feeling good, then all of a sudden, right, you do a little something and now it's back. Of course you're worried. Did I really mess this up now? Am mm -hmm. I am I fully messed up now? Man, I was doing good and now I feel shitty again. Right. So the the avenues there are to go down into that downward spiral or or try and figure yourself out of it. But again, it's not thinking yourself out of pain. There is not. If we could do that, that would be awesome. Like, oh, it's, I can, and it's like, for example, with what I said about my knee, I know all of these things, right? I know ex exactly what it is, or not exact, but I know what it is. I still have the pain though, mm -hmm. right? I still it, so you can't think your, your way out of it. Same thing with your back. As, as you got better and you realize, oh, it's not as bad, it didn't completely fully go to zero, mm -hmm. right? And that's because it's true. We still need the capacity. Uh, you, think, you can think about it in terms of strength and, and conditioning the same way. We can all run a marathon right now. We can. We can get up go 26 miles but how are we going to feel after or how are we going to feel the next week or two weeks later right we still have to have the capacity to do things and it's the same way with uh with pain and and being able to be in different positions and or do different movements we still have to build up our physical capabilities our capacity our tolerance our resilience right that still exists you know, pain or not. And so if we don't have that capacity, if we don't have that capability, pain is just a way of our, our body's way of reminding us, you know, probably not a good idea. Mm -hmm. We could do it. We could do anything we want, right? But how is it going to affect us after that, after doing the thing we want? There, I was just reading uh, in, in outside, there's this woman, I forget where she is. She's running... Ultra, an ultra ultra marathon miles every day for months yeah something like 50k 50 kilometers a day every day for months and months and months i look how can she do that the human body is so it's amazing amazing right yeah and you can say oh we can all work up to we can all do that and I, yeah we could probably could but man how right and how are we going to feel like i could how much of that is I though like kind of mental you know some sort oh, of she is mental mental right? mental, <laughs> mental illness like yeah <laughs> just like but i think uh i think those examples kind of tell you right you can take it in a negative way well if she can do that then i should be able to do whatever but mm -hmm. I, I i look at it more as kind of aspirational it's like wow we can we can really do it. I think that's what I try to look at things like instead of going in a negative way of like, man, yeah. I wish I could do this. Right. Yeah. Or you, you know, again, social media is crazy because it's warped. You're seeing mm -hmm. the outliers and outliers, mm -hmm. right. Whether it's someone that can get to a very low body fat level or someone that can, you know, run a hundred miles a day or someone that can, you know, lift four times their body weight. You're seeing these people that are straight up outliers and you're thinking, if I can't do even a portion of that, then why am I doing anything? Right? That's mm -hmm. the attitude. Or you can look at it as aspirational. It's like, wow, the human body is very capable. And I try yeah, to do that. But it's hard. It's hard. You know, I'm getting older. I'm, I'm 48. And it's a lot different than being 28. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm doing things that, you know, a lot of people my age are not capable of for whatever reasons right 
I would probably say it's people hard. in their 20s as well, Jarlo. <laughs> I've seen the stuff you yeah, do, I, man. Well, I think that's what a lot of it is because I tried to, you know, tried to keep up, tried to be knowledgeable, tried to be uh, kind to myself on some things. But it's hard. It's super hard. Every day, again, every day is a chance to learn more about yourself. And, you know, that's what's the your kind of current, that I'm trying to have. what's your week look like training wise? Like, what sort of stuff are you doing? Oh, uh, well, again, I'm kind of still recovering from, from this COVID thing. I think mm-hmm. it might be a little bit of the, you know, I was just talking to a, a friend about I'm getting some nausea, some sort of fatigue after only a little bit of work. And I said, yeah, that's, that's we're we've seen that. We're seeing that in some post-COVID patients. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I was doing a lot of uh, conditioning work since last summer. Uh, because that's always been my uh, kind of weakness. So I was doing like four hours of zone two and, you know, <laughs> because I just wanted to, right? But oh. I would, you know, it gave me a chance to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. Uh, oh. I like strength training a lot. I've always done that since I was a kid. So no matter what I do, I always have a couple of heavy sets of, you know, legs and, and all that kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. but if I was going to say what I do primarily, it, it's, it's martial arts training. So I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, I'm a brown belt in that I do Kali Filipino martial arts. I teach that I practice that, you know, I'm doing Chinese internal martial arts more in the last few years, uh, Bagua Zhang, and that's online training with my friend, Karsten, who's over in Germany. The thing, man, there's so many you could we can learn so many things from so many people around the world. It's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but my training, cool. my training, like the bulk of it is martial arts training. Um cool. I just like strength training. I like lifting weights, right? I just like it. Which is funny because you know, our our company is, you know, body weight training and you know, locomotion and all that stuff. To me, actually, I don't even think of that as my training because I just do it, right? Whether it's warming up or whether it's a part of my martial arts training, right? And for me, doing that, how can I say this? It doesn't give me the stimulus I need to improve. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Totally. Right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things, and this was years ago, I was doing... You know, we're doing Elements. Elements is our uh, flagship local motion program. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it would just came out and we're, or before it came out and we were doing it. And I would do 20, 25 minutes straight of bear crawl, monkey, you know. And this is in my house. I just go in the hallway, right? And play some music and do that. Mm-hmm. Right? That was my zone too. Mm. And not a lot of people can do that, I think. Right? You said a lot or not, not a lot? Not, not a lot of people oh, can do that, I think. Right? That's interesting. Whether it's their hands yeah. or whether it's whatever. But for me, it actually, I'm not, you know, I'm kind of being whatever, but it was okay. It was fine. It wasn't a stimulus. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, everyone kind of remarks on, like, I can squat low or my hips are like this. and Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something I've maintained since I was like 16, 17, 18. So does that that's make sense? Point. Like my training and the things I choose to do, uh, they fit me. Mm. And I think you like if I were... also the, sorry, mate, the, just the point you made there, like you're 48, like you've never really stopped training as well, which I think is a really yeah, important point. That's massive. There, you know, there was a period in like my whatever, but I always did something, and so that's the thing too. Is with uh, say my personal, my own training, your own training, it fits what we need, mm-hmm. right? And I, I would be dishonest if I was going to stay be on this this uh, podcast and go, oh, I only do, thir- I I only do locomotion. You just do elements, isn't it? That's all. I just do. I just do elements because, yeah. and it's not saying that 
that's not a correct or uh, a thing that someone can do. Because we have plenty of clients and you have clients too that the locomotion three times a week or four times a week for half an hour is awesome for them. It's exactly what they need. They love it and it's perfect for them and it gives them the stimulus and it works, right? But for me, I, I need a little bit more Yeah, where I am. But there are also times where that's all I, that's all I do. Like, especially now, a couple times a week, I'm like, oh, okay, I do some strength training. But then I'm, I'm like, I can't do it right now. And it's, it's hard psychologically. It's like, oh, I, I want to be able to do more. I went from, you know, eight hours a week of training to like three. Yeah. Right. Psychologically, it's hard. But I can spend 20 minutes of, you know, if I, especially if I feel very fatigued, I will do my location work. I will do this. I will do my mobility work. So it's hard, right? I mean, I don't want to be disingenuous or I don't want to say, oh, you need to do more, right? You need to squat or you need to deadlift or you need to, you know, do this. No, you have to figure that out for yourself. Yeah. That's, That's my main uh, thing. That's my main thing. You have to I'm going to, I'm going to edit all this last five minutes out and it's just going to be you saying, elements is just by elements that's it right because that's exactly. what i do <laughs> exactly. just you dubbed <laughs> Amazing. but it, it's it might be though see that's the thing and it's hard for me to have conversations like this because you can argue or you can say a lot of different things and that's why i think you know oh you have to do this 40 minutes so you have to do this and you have to do this it's easy to say Mm-hmm. Because you can just say that versus what I, you know, I was just rambling for 15 minutes and I almost didn't say anything other than you need to kind of know yourself and figure out a way to do, these, you know, figure out what's best for yourself. That is hard advice. Yeah. It didn't really tell you anything, did it? If I just say, oh, you have to figure it out on how to be yourself. That didn't say anything. You actually have to do things. Right, you actually have to do the things to figure out who you are and what it is for yourself. So that's why we have programs like Elements or Mobility or Sequences, right? Or a uh, exam, or another company might have a template for a powerlifting program, or a couch to five k, right? Mm-hmm. Or any kind of program, any kind of method has a plan. For someone to follow because you a lot you do need something to do to figure out who you are Does yeah that make sense? right that's what and i, I love I, going do, and doing uh, that i love doing other people's programs i'm right now i'm doing uh some different uh, i'm doing this class online class with integrated uh kinetic uh rehabilitation integral they're out of ireland uh, oh right yeah integrated kinetic neurology and also there's this man who's a physio his name is david gray he's awesome man he's yeah, yeah. i started his, his programs a couple months ago mm. and i'm like ah this is great right i like doing other people's things so i can kind of see where they're coming from and again help our clients and i could say that it's like, oh yeah, I just do this program or just do this program. Because you do need something. You need some sort of scaffolding to figure out who you are and what you need. Yeah. Like let's just say for someone listening, let's just say it's a guy, he's he's 40, we'll say, okay. And uh he's got two kids, busy job, maybe he was a bit athletic in his teens. And this is vague, so obviously, you know, sure. Just 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 as kind of like an avatar. And he's listening to this. He hasn't done anything in a few years. And he's like, yeah, you know, I've had some back issues and my kids are growing like young and I want to be able to keep up with them. What like could you give like maybe two or three nuggets? Obviously, it's general advice. It depends. But like what would be kind of a few things after, you know, your your knowledge, seeing thousands of clients with GMB and everything? What would be kind of the one to four steps someone like this could start working on today? That's a good one. Well, first is 
you have to again you know yourself a little bit about what you would uh what you would be able to do consistently right first thing is whatever you can do consistently right whether that's walking your dog right or going to the gym or doing a online program you have to first step is whatever you choose is it something you'd like enough right to do consistently and that's funny to say right well you got to like it first you do if you're going if you're heading into every session that you have just hating it how is that helpful at all right which is why it's great that there's all kinds of things for people right again if you like jogging or if you like doing pilates if you like doing locomotion calisthenics or you like lifting weights so that's the first thing you know take a take a look inside and go okay i know i want to do something to help my health and, and do all these things so the first thing is what do you think i could like or what do i think i could i would like and the next thing is how much time do i really have and that's another honest assessment that you have to be super super honest with you can say oh well, i got 5 hours a week right but if that's not true you're already shooting yourself in the foot so the first thing is you have to do an activity or choose an activity that you think you're going to like Wh whether you know that from experience or whether you look at it and go oh that looks fun that looks good I i'll be able to try that then you have to think about how much time you really have so think about how much time you really have and then cut that in half i like that you know what i mean right think about the time you really have cut in half so if you go i could probably do you know 45 minutes a day then really that's probably 20 minutes a day 20 30 minutes a day i think those are the first two steps that you have you have to kind of figure out what what you like or what you think you would like and then how much time you really have see how that's different than going i need to work on my cardio i need to work on my zone strength. two for 45 right. minutes that's right it. <laughs> i need to work on my mobility and and that's the hardest part because yes it's all true all of that's true but if zero or everything are the choices, it's very unhelpful, right? So in your example, someone like that has the kids, hasn't done anything in a while, I think first, those first two things, and it might even be that don't choose a program yet, work on the time that you do have and carve out, first carve out that practice time where say you know you have a half hour four times a week during that half hour just mess around go out for a walk go up and down your stairs a few times do a few push-ups see if you can get into the habit of just doing anything for that half hour and this is what i mean by i like doing different programs and i like doing different things because that scaffolding, that kind of framework just makes you do stuff, right? You print out a couple of pages, uh, and that's what I've been doing with, with David Gray's work. I can print out a couple of things. Like, oh, man, I have never done medicine ball work. That's cool, mm. right? Is it necessarily helpful? I don't know. Some of it, yeah. A couple of exercises, like, oh, man, I can't do that at all. So that's helpful. But I'll do the whole thing. Right, I done the whole. I did the whole thing for a month. I was like, "Oh, now I can choose from it." Cool. So that's. I don't know. That might be a little contradictory. Where I'm saying, "Oh, you have to don't you have to figure out things for yourself." But first, you have to follow some stuff. To see where yeah. You're at, right. It's a very you. You have to have experience first before you can kind of adjust, and right, you have to have something to adjust from. <laughs> Yeah, and I That's think what part, you just man. shared, totally, because like what you shared about understanding yourself, I think comes later. But having that scaffolding, oh, yeah, I think, is a really good term that you you, yeah, you know. Yeah, you can't. 
And that's the hard part, right? Because I could just be talking for an hour like we have and like, oh, you got to know yourself because you can do it. But I'm coming from my experience of, of doing lots of different things, right? I'm coming from my experience of, again, I do powerlifting programs, I've done yoga, I've done martial arts, I'm doing lots of ph physiotherapy stuff, I'm doing, right? And that's because I know where I've been and have the capabilities. And so again, why don't I just do elements? Or why don't I just do integral strength? Why don't I just do the programs that my company sells? It's because I've done them. Do I just want to do those things forever? Some people, sure. And some people, great. But uh, no, that doesn't make sense to me. So why do, why do we give people programs if we're just saying you need to figure out for yourself? Because you can't figure out for yourself until you have some sort of foundation, some base, right? So for that, man, this is, you know, this is a commercial. I would say do elements. Yeah. Because if you don't really know where you, where you, what you want to do or what you want to, you know, maybe your history or you, or you don't like lifting weights or you don't like going to a spin class, you know you don't like those things. Why should I say, oh, go do those things because they're the best thing for your, you know, for your uh, developing maximal strength or you have to go on the, the rower like I've been on the rower because that's really great for your you know, cardiovascular health if you don't like it. Right. So again, this is a lot of meandering. Why, why are people saying very concrete Right statements because it's much easier to do that than to what we just did talked for an hour about knowing yourself, right? So mm -hmm. that's why we make programs like Elements and Integral and Strength and you know all the different GMB things because it gives people a framework to understand themselves better. They're great programs to get you moving your body because that's another thing too: strength, conditioning, all those types of things. Yes, they're helpful, but a lot of people still don't know how to move well. Yeah. Or understand their think, bodies. That's why I think elements it just ticks so many boxes for this kind of avatar, like 40 year old guy hasn't maybe done much. Absolutely. You're gonna feel Absolutely. so good doing a program like that versus a powerlifting program or something. Like physically yeah. you're just gonna feel really good. Yeah. But it also we have a lot of clients where it supplements they're running, they're powerlifting, mm -hmm. they're, uh, you know, whatever sport they do, they do. And it's great. It can be a supplement or it can be your main thing. It's something that you have to kind of figure out for yourself. But I think the reason it is great is because it does, again, take those boxes off of moving, uh, moving your hips in a certain way, understanding where your back and your spine is you know, using your hands. So that's another thing too. We don't, sometimes it's depending on your job or other stuff. You don't use your body. You don't, mm -hmm. right? So elements and skill work, right? Motor control work has actual goals. That's another, like we could talk for hours on this stuff. But one of the things that in research and in practice is that when you have, actual physical uh, targets, right? Something to do externally with your body. It's much better. It's much better than, uh, uh, again, thinking you need to, you know, focus on a certain muscle, right? Or you might have to for rehab, but it's much better to have a goal-oriented, task-oriented uh, program. Right. Yeah. Can you give an example from elements? Like, would you just say learning the bear or the hip twist bear? Or yeah. Like so, say with be... the bear, say with the bear, all, all, you know, bear, monkey, frogger, crab, what you're doing when you're pushing through your hands and you're moving your body through space and you need to get, you want to get from point A to point B, but you're trying to do so with, uh, keeping your hips low or keeping your hips high or pushing your hands uh, alternately 
or moving your hands side to side in the same in the same way like these goal sets you have you have uh, distinct goal sets in your movement for a certain uh for a certain target that's what i that we you know very generically and broadly when we say when i say moving your body around right mm -hmm. cuz you can It goes to uh, what we were saying earlier. You can only know yourself when you have a kind of a foundation, right? You can only know what movement capabilities you have or can explore with when you have that foundation. Dancing is a great example, right? Dancing, you can't freestyle or improv dance if you don't even have fundamental positions, right? Right? You can't just mm -hmm. move around. Right. Yeah. Well, some people do, but even the best one that looks so free form have some technique in it. Yeah. Right. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. Like you should dance and, you know, move around even if you have no technique, but you have much, you'll have much more uh, capabilities and uh, vocabulary, right. Have a much wider armamentarium if you have uh already put in a foundation of saying things you can do. So that's why I would say bear, monkey, frogger, crab, all of these kind of locomotions, they literally have a dozen different ways to do them. Totally. Right? Yeah. Right? So let's say you have bear, monkey, frogger, crab, that's four. And, it's, and there's more than three variations of each. Right? So you got nine 18 27 right 35 different motions right there mm -hmm. and that's just in one you know from those movements and then within those variations there's different ways to shift your body more towards your feet shift your body more towards your hands you know it's you can do this forever yeah right so you can do it forever right good point as well about dancing i'm I'm actually going bachata dancing tonight i started doing it like uh about two months ago and it's so nice uh, it's like latin dance it's just it's amazing how badly i you know <laughs> even though i've been like a movement coach for like yeah, six, six seven because years you don't have that right because that's not exactly in your uh system yeah right and now you know after five or six weeks like you're saying i have the baseline patterns and now i'm actually able to enjoy moving more versus like just awkwardly shuffling around the place so sure i think that's uh but also true. with your background you can actually get into those movements and positions does that make sense and that was totally. that's a big part of why i did uh, years ago you know focus flexibility and then now mobility it's not that you have to be able to do a pigeon or have to be able to do you know a certain motion but working on those things exposes your body to different positions gives you more choices right to me that's the huge thing can we give ourselves more physical choices so that you can go and, and learn some latin dance or you can go and go try rock climbing or you can go on that weekend hike and not feel uh, not feel like you can't do anything or right get so anxious that, oh, man, I haven't done this forever. When you've given your body these options and you've expanded your options, that's massive. That's massive. Totally, mate. Uh, I want to finish with some rapid fire questions, Jarlo. So... The first one I want to go into is what book or books would you recommend? Maybe like fiction and then maybe some uh, sports rehab mindset oh, books. Fiction. Man, that's hard. I like a lot of science fiction, fantasy stuff. Oh, cool. I just Me finished, too. Uh, I just finished uh, the Tchaikovsky, Adrian Tchaikovsky. He, uh, what's it? What's the children Chil of time. children yeah 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 i haven't read yeah, it but so, it's on the list yeah so children of time is a trilogy and he just came out with the last one and i read those um science fiction i like Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin. Le Guin. yeah 
very heady, deep science, science fiction stuff. Um, is fantasy, that the author or, or the name of the Yeah, Le Guin series? is the author, Ursula. L-E-G-U-I-N. Oh, Ursula. She's great. Um, oh. I think she she may have passed away a couple years ago. Uh, nonfiction, I really liked uh, Endure by Alex Hutchinson. I think What's it's that a, about you. So he uh, he writes for outside. I think his column is Sweat Science, and he wrote this book a few years ago about uh, you know he's a runner and endure like endurance. You know, looking at you know the physical capabilities and you know what exactly is it to to uh, you know work towards your V two max and all that kind of thing. That was really eye opening. Uh, so I like that. I like, you know, if we're going to talk about for trainers and things, this is one I've been reading a bunch over the last couple of years. Franz Bosch. Mm -hmm. So cool. strength training and coordination, what he's talking about is more of strength work and strength training, not just for athletes, but for everybody is more to control work. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just having a heavy squat to be able to jump higher, right? Or run faster. And that I think people will understand that. But it's also that we shouldn't be enamored with like very specific specialized exercises that have no transfer over. So that's kind of a deep, deep work, but I like that a lot. Cool. I encountered him a few years ago or his work a few years ago, and I just keep coming back to it because it's just excellent. Great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next question. What are you most grateful for and why? Well, right now, I think I'm grateful for my health and my family's health. You know, I've had our own kind of struggle over the years, but uh, everything thankfully turned out well for all of us. So. I think that's, right. that's a pretty standard answer, but it's the real answer. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What would you say is your biggest achievement? Or greatest um, achievement? I think that's hard. I think it is the company. I think it is GMB. Because like I said before, you know, working a lot, you know, helping as much people as I can. I, If you would have told me, you know, 20 years ago, okay, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people reading your work, watching your videos, you know, tens of thousands of people actually doing, you know, your, your programs and say, what are you talking about? So yeah, yeah, I'm very proud of what we've done. Yeah. Big time, man. Yeah. I think like you just said earlier, like the impact versus working for 50, 60 years, seeing clients in person, it's still not going to scratch the surface. right? Yeah. And, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with that. And I have friends that have done that forever. And I probably I could have done it too. But I think uh, we're very lucky to have found a platform, right? And, you know, a dozen years ago, not a lot of people were doing it. Not a lot of people were saying the things we were saying. A lot of mm -hmm. people are now, which is great. And not saying that they're copying us or whatever. It's just that it, now that information is out there, it's helpful, it's useful. The same thing with uh, whether it's in being a physio or being a personal trainer or being a doctor or being a chiropractor or whatever, the information out there is so much better now. Uh, and we've kind of railed against bad information out there, but you know the people you know fighting against that is is higher too now. Big time. So I'm you know yeah it's great. Yeah. Last question, if you could put something on a billboard to reach uh, millions, if not billions of people, what would you say and why? Uh, <laughs> I, th I think it would be uh, find, find a way to know yourself better. Awesome. Right? That's a huge thing for me. You know, that's the attitude I think uh, uh, has helped me the most. It's like kind of acknowledging my tendencies, who I am, and and trying to everyone's it's like try to change your self work or, you know whatever yeah but i think you first need to uh know your foundation know who you are first before you can you know again be honest with yourself yeah that's a huge one not just i know we talked about like physical training but everything like from uh oh, psych yeah, psychologically 
emotionally, everything. Amazing, all man. All intertwined. One hundred percent, mate. I got so many notes here um, <laughs> from talking to you. Well, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I I know it's rambling, and that's the hard part for who I am and kind of where I'm at now. Is I don't think there's any easy answers to any of this. And so again, that's why this is a really hard thing to parse through for for a lot of people. And why communicating one one is important, and and doing our best for people is important. Uh, but it's not. I found it not easy, not an easy thing to be truthful and, and honest. You know. Yeah, and I just think it's nice just to go into nuance, like in a conversation, versus like forty five minutes. That's all you need to do. <laughs> That's yeah. what the research says, you know? Right. So, yeah. So wh- where can people learn more about you, Gerardo, if they want to check out your work? Yeah. Or so kind of more about your information. So gmb.io is our website. Um, we have all of our programs. We have free content up the wazoo. That's another thing too, right? Over the last 12, 13, 14 years, We've just been putting out a lot of content that's been there on you know YouTube videos and articles and posts. And it's it's unreal the amount of response we've had, but uh, we've really worked hard to put out quality material and quality material that you you know is out there for free, right? As well as the the material we have if you become a client. Yeah, this is like I because like we we got chatting again uh because your most recent article so for people listening like Gerlo just wrote a recent article on pain as well and it's it's excellent like so strongly recommend people to check that out as well thank you very much